You're listening to a Life in Quebec podcast. For more, visit lifeinquebec.com. I'm Andrew Greenfield and welcome to the 2015 election coverage for uh, from lifeinquebec.com. I'm with Colin Standish, who is a uh, former prospective candidate for the Liberal Party in a riding of the eastern townships of Quebec. So, uh, Colin, uh, Canadian general election 2015, welcome. Um, you're up to speed on federal politics. Has anything caught your eye so far with regards to the parties or the candidates in, in the campaign? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Andrew. I really appreciate it. And uh, I know it'll be wonderful to work in life in, life in Quebec, that we've worked together covering Quebec politics for the last several years, and it's, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to be here today. Um, but yeah, certainly um, you mentioned uh, particularly the candidates now, and, and it seems that uh, and to, to a certain way that, uh, that some of the parties weren't necessarily ready, that a full slate of candidates wasn't elected, that uh, I think there was a recent nomination in Louis Hebert just a few days ago and uh, uh, for the Liberal Party of Canada, so there's not actually a full uh, a full uh, string of, uh, sorry, slate of candidates at times, and I know there's going to be uh, one to watch is going to be a Hunsic Cartier bill where you have Mary, um, uh, uh, Madame uh, Melanie Jolie, sorry, <laughs> wrong first name, um, but that's been a really one to watch that had seven prospective candidates there. Melanie Jolie jumped in, um, and there's a lot of debate about whether she'll, she'll win or not. Um, so, it's, so it's interesting. And even um, in uh, Toronto, there was recently where there was uh, Eve Adams had the election there, and she was sort of the establishment candidate. She didn't win. Also, Mount Royal was an interesting one uh, for liberals and conservatives, and you saw Stephen Harper actually launch his campaign there. When the prime minister shows up in your riding, uh, that's very significant. So they really are targeting uh, Mount Royal in the island of Montreal, symbolic for the Liberal Party of Canada. It's been held since 1940 by the liberals, and it was Pierre Trudeau's former riding, and Anthony Housefather, the mayor of Cote St. Luke, former president of Alliance Quebec, and, um, and an attorney as well, uh, to boot, a very multi-talented person. He's going head-to-head with Robert Lidman there. So um, so that's sort of a scattering, but uh, it's interesting. There's not a full set of uh, slate of candidates, but as well, you have interesting battles still going on, and then you really have some interesting battles that are heating up um, in regards of candidates um, in local elections where the party's not actually as significant, um, the banners necessarily. It really is a battle of personalities and wits, it seems, so... Okay, so going back to, to Stephen Harper launching his uh, election campaign in the province of Quebec, why do you think that's so important for him? Yeah, no, that's very symbolic. I mean, it really, it seems that Conservatives, um, two, twofold, maybe three, I would say, really, to, to launch it in, in Mount Royal, that's highly significant. They, As I was just saying before, they really want it, they want, um, they really want that seat. It's highly symbolic for the Liberal Party of Canada. Um, they've really targeted it. It has about 35% um, are, uh, are, are, Jewish and religion in that riding. So the Conservatives in the last few years have really tried to target that particular religion or ethnicity of, of Jewish Canadians um, to try to appeal to them. So they really want to win Mount Royal. And secondly, as well, they really are targeting 10 to 15 seats from the Saguenay down to the Beauce. So they really have looked at Quebec City. They're looking at Chicoutimi, La Bay, and uh, in that area as well, and then right down to the Beauce near the eastern townships where I'm from. Um, and the Gantic Lehab, I believe, is, uh, is uh, Christian Peretzi um, at the moment. So they really are looking to make a win in that corridor there, which is more small C conservative. And then they do want Mount Royal. And as well, they want to reverse sort of the perception that Harper is quote unquote an- a- anti Quebec, that Stephen Blaney, um, you know, there's an article, um, it was Radio Canada, no, it was La Presse, and it was just sort of, you know, conservative values, you know, Quebec values are conservative values and vice versa, that they want to. Uh, rebut the presumption that somehow the Conservative Party is not Quebec or Quebecois. So, okay, so uh, seventy-eight days of campaigning. Uh, we've only just got begun. We're a week or so into it. It's a long, long campaign. Uh, is it too early to call who's going to win? Oh, certainly. This is. I mean, it's it's a fascinating campaign to watch. It really sort of caught a lot of people off guard that um, that it's been sort of a permanent campaign to a certain extent, but. Um, yeah, this, I mean, it's a marathon, right, of 11 weeks, um, and as well, you really have a three-party race for the first time in Canadian history. You really had the three parties at about 30%. You had, I believe, the NDP uh, at, out of the starting gates with the highest percentage, about 33%. Then you had the Conservatives, 31%, and then you had the Liberals, maybe 27 28%. So really a, a strong three-way race. It's going to be very exciting for all Canadians. Every vote is going to count. And then, obviously, in Quebec, that we have the Bloc Québécois. And with a new leader, Gilles Doucet, who is very personally popular, even though we got a shellacking in 2011, he's back in the game. So what does this all mean? Uh, really, it means that your val- your votes are highly valuable and 
they're going to be targeted. So I certainly encourage every Canadian to inform themselves of all the parties and, and leaders and, and make an educated choice on October 19th. Okay, so we're a week in to uh, 11 long weeks. We've already had the first televised uh, debate. It was on City TV the other night. It was the McLean's debate hosted by uh, Paul Wells. Um, many pundits, if you look at the, the media out there, are saying Thomas Mulcair came out strong, uh, that Justin Trudeau did better than expected, and Stephen Harper held steady. I mean, you, I'm sure you watched the debate. What do you think? Yeah, no, no, thank you. That, no, that was... Uh quite fascinating to see because there was that mid-summer debate was already planned and then suddenly the election was called so no it was fascinating so I really um, I think the star of the night was Elizabeth May I think she had an incredibly strong performance particularly on the economy where often the Green Party is assumed uh, to, to, not, to not be as, as concerned with those issues they're more social I think Elizabeth May did an exceptional job on the economy she really called out Stephen Harper with very precise information and, uh, and I don't think he rebutted it thoroughly. I felt Mr. Harper as well. Um, he came off as very defensive throughout the debate that, uh, that I, I, I didn't find his performance great. But when you're an incumbent like Mr. Harper, where you've been prime minister for 10 years, um, you really win by not losing a debate. So I don't think he lost. Um, I found Mulcair, I found his, bo uh, not to make it too personal, but I found his body language um, and, and the way he came off, not necessarily. I don't think it would. It's going to appeal to Canadians and Quebecers in the way he wanted to. And I found his answers actually not as in depth. I would have. Uh, I would have thought for Mr. Mulcair, who's a very intelligent man. And obviously Trudeau. Um, he's he's been lauded for his performance in the debate. He was fiery. He was articulate. He was intelligent. So, but I think I think all in all, we saw four leaders um, really do a great job. But uh, Elizabeth May gets my star of the match for that one. So, but do you think uh, her party would continue continue to be to to be marginalised then, in effect, because she's not going to form a government, um, maybe not even going to be able to hold sway, uh, because it's just the party's just not big enough. So, uh, are no, are they really that important? Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a very you know that's a very uh, interesting observation. But in certainly where the end the Green Party is very strong is sort of lower mainland BC, where you really have. The NDP going ahead with the with uh, the Liberals, so could you see a few more green seats there, or in other parts of Canada, or it could really how much the Green Party strips away from the NDP or Liberals, vice versa, could really determine a lot in this election. I think in Lower Mainland BC and other parts of British Columbia where they are strong, um, I think a strong Green Party performance uh, could 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 make the difference um, in in various key swing ridings in parts of British Columbia. Okay, so um, you touched on Gilles Duceppe coming back. He's, you know, he's back in the game. He's the, the leader again of the Bloc Québécois. Um, as ever, uh, uh, Quebec separation came up in a, a federal debate uh, at election time, as it always does. Um, is that relevant today? And uh, what role can the Bloc expect to play this time round? No, it's a great question. And Mr. Duceppe is a very strong debater. And unfortunately, he was missing from the McLean's debate. I understand he wasn't invited, which is unfortunate that, you know, that Quebecers, English, French speaking or others should, you know, and, and other Canadians from the rest of Canada should be able to hear that voice that it's, uh, that uh, I think it's very strong for, you know, important for a democracy. But certainly, um, and this is something that, that I think we saw brought up in the debate was the issue around the Clarity Act, around the Sherbrooke Declaration, around referendums, around separatism, that Mr. Trudeau and Mulcair had one of the big clashes of the night. Um, and that was quite interesting because, um, just to give it some, some context, the NDP has something called the Sherbrooke Declaration, a policy that would recognize, you know, that repudiates a lot of what was said in a Supreme Court reference about the framework for a referendum. And, uh, and I have very strong opinions on this. There's an article uh, with Life in Quebec that I encourage your viewers to check out that I've written one on the NDP's policy and also on the framework for referendum. So I, I really encourage the viewers to, to, to read those articles. And I won't get into too, too much about my personal opinions on the subject, but it was interesting to see that clash is that uh, Mr. Mulcair wants to make, um, or sorry, Mr. Trudeau wants to make Mr. Mulcair uh, squirm a little bit because um, there has been a lot of acquiescence, in my opinion, and, and by pundits uh, to Quebec nationalists and separatists within the, uh, the NDP movement in Quebec, and that sort of hushed up in the rest of Canada. So Mr. Mulcair, uh, Mr. Trudeau was really trying to call out Mulcair, and then you saw Mr. Mulcair said, what's your number? Um, so number meaning what would your percentage, would you recognize a Quebec sep or referendum vote on independence as being legitimate, and Mr. Actually, I think Mr. Trudeau, the really the the most brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, rhetoric of the night was Mr. Trudeau. He said nine is my number, and everyone was a little confused. And he said nine Supreme Court justices, etc. That we believe in rule of law, and this is the framework. So I think he, he really had a very well prepared answer and well delivered. Um, but but 
sort of bring it back to the subject, uh, you know, the block and, and the independence movement is not going away, and it's a voice that um, is that uh, even though uh, my, many of my views are antith- antithetical to what they stand for, certainly for them to be in this race, and I, I don't count Mr. Duceppe or the Bloc Quebecois out in any respect in this in this election. Okay, so um, what do you think the main issues are going to be during this campaign for the parties? Yeah, well, that's an excellent question. I, I really think the economy is on a lot of people's minds, and that was a very strong debate on the economy um, in the in the uh, in the debate last week. That all all four of them sparred over it. That missed, that basically. Um, as economists will say, and as the party leaders are making very clear to Mr. Trudeau or Mr. Mal- Mr. Harper, rather, is that uh, that we spent five months in in uh, with our economy contracting, right? And so, are we in a recession? Are we not? Um, we've seen the collapse in the price of oil. What's that going? How will that impact governor of revenues going forward? We have an NDP government in Alberta. How will that impact social spending in the in Canada's economic new economic heartland? So it's going to be quite interesting. I think the economy is on a lot of people's minds. Um, I think in Quebec, it's um, you know I think that's going to play out a lot in the rest of Canada. Obviously, still in Quebec, but in Quebec, I think there's going to be that that battle, that four-way battle between the Bloc, between the NDP, and the Liberals and the Conservatives. And an interesting thing in Quebec um, is that one thing I have to keep in mind: the NDP really, you know, they're on the island of Montreal, they're in Quebec City, they're in the eastern townships, um, that they're everywhere. They really they're they're fighting different battles. So in the island of Montreal, they're going to head to head with the Liberals. Um, they're going head to head with the Bloc Québécois and much of uh, francophone or overwhelmingly French-speaking Quebec. In the eastern townships, Liberal versus NDP often, with the Bloc maybe coming back. And then, like I was saying, there's a strip from the Saguenay down to um, down to the boats. They're going head-to-head with the Conservatives. So the NDP really has to fight uh, a pitch three, three-way three battle in different regions of Quebec, and that's going to be really interesting. Are they strong enough Are they strong enough to do it this time around? Uh, the ND, the, sorry, the NDP, then? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's quite interesting because I, as a former uh, nomination candidate for Liberal Party, I literally was going door to door in uh, Compton Stance. It is my home riding, and it has, a, you know, it's sort of a, a bilingual, federalist leaning riding. It's it's very much a swing riding. It's been four different parties in the last twenty years. So how Quebec goes, it's it often is. It's not considered a bellwether riding, but it basically will go with the winner. So, but really, on my door to door, I met less than five NDP partisans. I met people who said they voted it last time. Um, but we're dedicated lifelong liberals or conservatives. So the base is very, the roots are very weak for the NDP in much of Quebec. And I think that they, I've seen articles um, that they really haven't raised much money, just several thousand dollars for some of their associations. So how much their 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 political organization, I think, I think there is a lot of weakness, how much that impacts their ability to campaign um, remains to be seen. Okay, so um, this, as we've already mentioned, this 11 weeks, a long, long campaign, one of the longest in Canadian history, in fact. Um, how are the parties going to adapt to this as they go along, do you think? That's a, that's a great question, uh, Andrew, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's, un- it's nearly unprecedented, the length of this campaign. So I think, um, you know, one thing that people called up Mr. Harper for was that this is a very crass political move. Uh, sort of Machiavellian because, you know, suddenly election spending laws come and come into play and those are very, um, I've had to deal with Elections Canada, so it's, you know, you really do need to go by the letter of the, you know, by the letter of the law and it's very, as it should be, um, there's a lot of scrutiny on elections expenses and, and fundraising, so, um, and that's, that's something that the Har- Harper really has a full war chest. So you see that, there was an article today, I believe in the Globe and Mail that said that, you know, Harper's on his jet and the NDP and Liberals are just using commercial um, aircraft or buses, right? So, I mean, it's you, you already see, you know, resources are going to be stretched to the bone, uh, down to the wire for this election that I experienced in my own nomination race. I expect to be six months. It was 51 weeks in the end that yeah. I, you know, simply near the end of it, that resources were, were very uh, marginal for my campaign, financial resources, and, and that's not the only factor that, that matters. But I think in this campaign, it's going to be really, um, you know, it's going to be an endurance race. It's a marathon. So, um, when when are you going to expend your resources now, or will it be in two months from now, right in the end? So it's going to be interesting to watch what the parties do and how they spend their money. So we're in early August. The election is um, October 19th. We've got a long, long way to go. How do the candidates and the parties stop voters getting bored of politics between now and then? What what can they do to, to, to make us want to vote for them? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I think that's going to be a big story of the race is who can, you know, a um, uh, big reason I lost my own nomination race is that people, some people didn't show up and the other teams, almost all of them did. It was really a question of turnout. And that's one way the Conservatives, in my opinion, it's been well documented by academics and by pundits, is that 
really they win when you don't vote, right? That the conservative uh, base is highly mobilized, that 40% of Canadians choose not to cast a ballot uh, in federal elections. So I think when, when you know, will you know, turnout will be a huge factor. And, um, and so to re- the parties want you to remain tuned in. I don't think the governing party wants Canadians necessarily to tune in as much because they win when you don't show up. That's been sort of the conservative, um, has been their ploy for the last decade. So it's going to be interesting to see. But I think here's one of the real, I think this is going to be one of the big stories of this election, Andrew, is, is data management. And that sounds like a silly thing to say, but everyone talks about Twitter and Facebook and 2008, 2011, but really it's data management. The sort of Obama, um, you know, political organization has come northward. Um, they have something called minivan and liberal list with the Liberal Party of Canada. I had to use it personally. But it's very sophisticated stuff where you really are identifying and targeting voters. So I think you're going to see, you know, they're going to know 20 demographic points on most Canadians, and you will get literature sent to your door saying you are, you know, basically they'll know you are a woman or whatever gender of a certain age, certain income, these certain interests. You're going to see very targeted messaging. So look for it. So when you get an ad, uh, if you're a student getting, you know, if you see an ad for, you know, a new student loan program from the government of Canada, well, that's not... That's not a mistake when you have two young children at the door and suddenly you're hearing about uh, Justin Trudeau's plan for fairness, right? So you're gonna, it's going to be highly targeted, this campaign, so they're going to make it very personal. Okay, so Colin uh, Standish, thank you very much. We'll be in touch again. So uh, here at Life in Quebec, we'll keep you regularly updated with what's going on uh, with the Canadian uh, federal general election for 2015, and uh, thanks for watching. Thank you for listening to a Life in Quebec podcast. For more news, editorials, and opinion, visit lifeinquebec.com.